take it you're vigilante. No. You sound like him. No, I don't. Welcome back, Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in episode four of Peacemaker. The episode picks up in the aftermath of the attack on Senator Goff's house and deals with the personal and professional repercussions. There's a lot of characters reckoning with their past, their parents, and what kind of person they want to be. Also, there's some dick jokes. The title, The Chode Less Traveled, is referring to the conversation that Chris had with his dad. You're comparing yourself to a chode. Not in a bad way. But it also speaks to the theme of the show, that Chris is slowly trying to be his own kind of manhood. Man, he's trying to be his own kind of man. But I'll get into the episode's themes a little later in the video. The episode was directed by Jody Hill, a great comedy director who co-created Eastbound and Down. How much y'all give me if I slam dunk this thing into Nothing. the trash can? Nothing. We start off the episode learning fun facts about our toes. You can't walk if you lose your metatarsal. That's like the knuckle of the pinky toe, but if you just lose your pinky, it's fine. You want a toe? I can get you a toe. There are a few Easter eggs in this episode that I also mentioned last week, but just in case this is your first time here, I'm gonna go over a few of them again. I'm sorry if you're a returning customer. The team is headquartered in an abandoned video store, which is weird because video stores are a flourishing business, right? The store is called Henenlotter Video, named after the great B-movie director Frank Henenlotter. Now, Henenlotter directed many films with the low-budget studio Troma, where James Gunn got his start. In fact, there is a poster for Troma's first movie, The First Turn On, right here. I know this because when I worked at Troma, my desk was right next to that poster. James Gunn even gave Troma co-founder Lloyd Kaufman a cameo in Guardians of the Galaxy right here. So, Mern and Peacemaker argue about why he froze up. But I'm not f***ing killing kids just because you say so! And as we see at the end of this episode, this is likely related to childhood trauma. He watched his brother die of a seizure, so every child that he sees after that is an extension of his brother. I'm sure the death of his brother also motivated him to work harder and be stronger later in life. You have to be double great for the both of us. I'm also guessing that he blames himself for his brother's death. Like maybe he hit him in the face and then he fell down and hit his head on a rock and had a seizure. This makes his murder of Rick Flagg even more tragic because he saw him as a proxy brother. Peacemaker. So now, for the rest of his life, he constantly feels the pain that he inflicted on his own brother, which is why they're both shown laying down in that final montage. He also mentions, Ever since I had a team up with Matter Eater Lad, my sense of what's known was a little f***ed up. Who is a real superhero? He was a member of the Legion of Superheroes, and yep, he ate Matter. Oh. Now, the Legion of Superheroes are a super team from the 31st century. There might be an Easter egg that ties into this that I'm gonna talk about later. Lietta is another person who is dealing with the repercussions of not being able to kill the night before. I've never killed anyone before. She even sneaks off to the bathroom to cry at work, which I can relate to. You're okay? Yeah, I'm fine, shut up. John is wearing the t-shirt Three Wolf Moon, which was made ironically famous by its outlandishly positive Amazon reviews. I get reviews on Amazon or tweets. Oh, oh. And we'll have to keep playing that song if he doesn't ever change his shirt. Thought we wouldn't notice, but we did. So, Mern dresses down Peacemaker for not being able to kill when it counted, making him feel like less of a man. So, he turns around and tries to emasculate Vigilante. Because you would feel really guilty if I gave that guy information because you were too much of a candy ass to take a little torture. Which is him copying the behavior of his father. I didn't mind f***ing sperm. Go into a Nancy boy like you. We see this a lot in this show, people thinking they have to copy the behavior of their a-hole parents, like Laetta and her mom, Amanda Waller. Otherwise you become like Amanda Waller and you start treating human life like it's nothing. Peacemaker even insinuates that Adrian's dad being gay makes him, and by extension Adrian, less of a man. Your dad left your mom for another dude. Hey. He did. Again, this is Chris copying his dad and trying to earn his love by being a hard ass. Adrian asks, Why does your father have an upside down American flag on his lawn? And as we explained last week, the official code of the flag says that the flag should only be flown upside down in times of distress. Now, since his dad thinks that America is under attack from, I guess, everybody, he flies the flag upside down. Now, on the news, we see that a gorilla has escaped from the zoo. Yeah, you gotta wonder if this is gonna pay off later on. So what do you guys think? Is this gonna be, like, related to Gorilla Grodd, or are the butterflies going to be mind-controlling a gorilla in the final climax? We definitely haven't seen the last of Charlie, unlike Harambe. We're 
Now, one of the helmets that Peacemaker takes is for X-ray vision, a famous power of Superman's that I can't wait to see Peacemaker use in this show. Then he sees his dad's comic-accurate White Dragon costume. In the books, White Dragon was a racist supervillain and a leader in the KKK. So his dad has tried to make Chris in his own image, training him to kill and creating weapons for him. But the series is going to show him growing beyond his father into his own man, the chode less traveled, one might say. Lietta is going through the same thing. She's living in the shadow of her mother, Amanda Waller. But Amanda Waller insisted you were ready. Both she and Chris relate to each other because they're both trying to be better people than their parents. Then he reveals how his dad can have such a large secret room. So how is it so big in this place? It's a quantum unfolding storage area. It leads to a dimensional nodule outside normal space. Now, the idea of pocket dimensions has been around in comics for a long time. A soul world from Marvel Comics and the movies is a pocket dimension inside the Soul Stone. But, in particular, this made me think about the Legion of Superheroes villain called the Time Trapper. Long story short, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, he created a pocket universe to destroy the Legion. So I'm wondering if this connection to pocket dimensions and time warping is how Peacemaker could have met Matter Eater Lad to begin with. Like, maybe his dad's folding space-time brought Matter Eater Lad to the present from the the distant future. Then he and Vigilante have an argument about ducks. How the f could that even happen? How would what happen? A duck in a human costume? The sizes are completely incompatible. So here's a question for you. Would you rather fight a duck the size of John Cena or 10 John Cena's the size of ducks? The setting is in a cage fight. I'll give you my answer at the end of the video. Outside the house, the neighbor name drops Batman's rogues gallery. Batman has a coterie of supervillains. Joker, Riddler, Mad Hatter. Because he is challenging the idea of what it means to be a superhero. Peacemaker sees himself as a hero while the world sees him as a villain. And this also goes back to the idea of what it means to be a man. This is why Chris calls out Batman's don't kill rule. Riddle me this, how many people you think Batman's indirectly murdered by being too much of a candy ass who wrestles with murderers dressed like clowns and throws them in prison? And of course, Riddle Me This is a reference to the Riddler and Clown Face is obviously the Joker. Chris has been raised to think that people who don't kill, like Batman, aren't real men. But as we see later in the episode, he's starting to question this because he keeps the butterfly instead of destroying it. But here's the thing. This movie is supposed to take place in the DC Extended Universe. But as we've seen, Ben Affleck's Batman does a lot of killing. Now, last week we pointed out that Peacemaker's diary has a sticker for the Wayne Foundation on it, which does not match the Wayne logo in the DCEU. Instead, it matches the Wayne Enterprises logo from the Nolan Batman universe. Now, that doesn't mean that Peacemaker takes place in the same universe as the Nolan movies. After all, we had several villains name drop that we never see appear in those films, like Riddler and Mad Hatter. But it does make me think that maybe Birds of Prey, The Suicide Squad, and Peacemaker all take place in yet another DC multiverse. Well, Warner Brothers has said that they're rebranding their extended universe as their extended multiverse, meaning that every DC property, TV shows, films, comics, all of that is part of a greater multiverse. Therefore, it's not out of question to assume that they just told James Gunn, look, go create whatever universe you want, have fun, don't worry about connecting to other films. Back in the car, we see a dashboard ornament of a rabbit in a cape and a WB shirt that reads, Obstacles Are Opportunities. This is actually the third time we've seen this rabbit. The first was on Rick Flagg's shirt in The Suicide Squad, and then here on the husband's t-shirt. It's referring to James Gunn being fired from Disney, briefly, and then being given the opportunity to work at WB on the DC Universe, hence the Superman cape and the Bugs Bunny lookalike. You know, you stinker. You'll notice from these police cars that this takes place place in a city called Evergreen, a suburb of Coast City, which first appeared in the 1960s Green Lantern comic books. And this is also in Charlton County, named after Charlton Comics, the original home of the Peacemaker and Judo Master. When he tells his dad about the butterflies, he says, These are real legal aliens. And that's an interesting metaphor. His dad hates immigrants because they're different from him. They're the other. And Chris could easily see all the butterflies in the same way. But instead, he keeps the butterfly in a jar, smokes with it and then they even seem to become buds. This is hinting that the butterflies are more than they seem, but I'm gonna talk about my butterfly theories a little later in the video. Lietta calls the Judo Master. Cobra Kai just got out. And he does indeed strike first after having some snacks. Judo Master. Peacemaker lands with a superhero landing. Props to Blade for doing it first. Woo! Superhero landing. Yeah, you know, that's really hard on your knees. Now I loved how when he entered the parking lot, we were transported into a Western duel. The whistle is like the score from an Ennio Morricone spaghetti western. 
and this blowing bag is like a tumbleweed. This is the kind of manly showdown that Peacemaker loves because it lets him live up to his dad's expectations of masculinity. You? You were just a blob of flesh I felt nothing for. They're fighting next to a truck from Atomic Age Deliveries. And the Atomic Age was a period in comics from the late 1940s through the 50s when there was a lot more focus on science fiction stories instead of superheroes. Now this later morphed into superheroes getting their powers from radioactivity, such as Spider-Man's radioactive spider bite. Then Mern name drops this classic comedy western. I thought Walla gave me soldiers. Is that as a f***ing apple dumpling gang? A classic film starring Don Knotts and the Incredible Hulk himself, Bill Bixby. It's a piece of cake. You mean it ain't gold? Of course it's gold, stupid. In prison, Adrian pisses off the white supremacists by giving black people credit for southern rock bands, Leonard Skinner, 38 Special, and ZZ Top. This monologue was a masterclass in pissing off terrible people. Then he calls them sloth from the Goonies, referencing this guy. During the final montage, Chris is dancing to House of Pain by Faster Pussycat, the same band that he's wearing on his t-shirt. And a dude's nerdery on Twitter pointed out that there are a lot of parallels between this final montage and the House of Pain music video. In particular, childhood trauma, fatherhood, and blue tints. And Mern is watching Lethal Weapon 4, a movie about uncovering a Chinese smuggling operation in Los Angeles. This scene features Mel Gibson, Danny Glover, Chris Rock, and your mom. Now I'm wondering if the smuggling plot of Lethal Weapon 4 is a clue about what's going on with the butterflies. <laughs> So let's talk about that final twist that Myrna is a butterfly. First of all, has he been a butterfly the whole time? The whole time? The whole time? You would have the whole time? Well, let's roll the tape. You've never shared any feeling? No. Nope. Like you've never even said, oh my God, I'm hungry. No. It's my dad, man. Jesus, you ever have a dad? I did. I wasn't created in a Petri dish. Yeah, I'm going to say he was always a butterfly. But remember what Judo Master says. Butterflies. They're not what you think. So the question here is why would Mern want to kill other butterflies like the Goff family? Well, I think that he is an evil butterfly and that these other butterflies are good. Maybe the butterflies just want to live in peace with humans, maybe bringing us advanced technology through Senator Goff's political power. After all, he was... Mostly known for being a radical proponent of climate change. So these aliens come to Earth and try to save the environment. We offered you paradise, but now, because of your distrustful nature, that can never be. But this other faction of butterflies led by Mern maybe want to take over the Earth. So he's trying to take the others out. Or maybe he's running some kind of interstellar smuggling operation, which would be a callback to the plot of Lethal Weapon 4. <laughs> and now my answer to the John Cena duck question. See, a duck doesn't seem dangerous, but a duck that's the size of John Cena would have the proportionate strength and durability of its size, and its bill could snap you in half just from the PSI of something so large. But it wouldn't have much maneuverability, especially in a cage fight. So I have to think that you could get in some shots in its throat or maybe even get behind it and strangle it. But 10 John Cena's the size of ducks would work as a team and they could take you down pretty easily, especially by climbing the sides of the cage. So my answer is I would rather fight one duck the size of John Cena. But what's your answer? Let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.